We are going to be reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 10 through 11, to begin with, and then we're going to go to the book of Romans. Join with me as we hear the word of Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word. That God's word will come back to him having completed his purpose. And we read now from Romans chapter 8 verses 26 through 39, the triumph of God's love. Hear now God's word. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the children of God, and all of God's children said, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, into this sanctuary. Pour down your grace, your mercy, your love. The love, Lord, that cannot separate that cannot be separated from you. Lord, we need it today more than ever. Fill our hearts and minds with the true knowledge of the depth of your love, of the depth of your commitment, of the depth of your creation, of the intricacies, Lord, that you have worked in and through us. And precious Lord, on this Sabbath day, your children are gathered humbly before your cross, seeking you seeking your face, seeking your word, seeking your guidance, seeking your knowledge, seeking your presence. And the message that you have, Lord, you know that I cannot give it without you, so speak through me in spite of me, that what is given and what is received is your word for your children on this, your Sabbath day. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. It's been one of those challenging weeks, guys. Last week, as you know, most of you, it was my birthday, and I'm not ashamed. It's 59, and there's something about those nines. <laughs> there's something about those nines. I didn't take 29 very well. By the time I got to 30, I was fine. 29, I was a mess. And, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to wish it on myself, but 59, you know, it's, it's one of those things. When I was 29, I looked at my life and thought, all of those things that I hadn't done yet. 
Well, praise the Lord, I have done all those things that I lamented back at 29, but here I am at 59, and I know that there's a whole lot less in front of me than is behind me. Um, and to top it all off, my youngest son, Friday, turned 30. So I no longer have a 20-something child. All of my children are 30 and up. And I wrote on his card, you will never know how much I love you. And I thought about that for a second. You will never know how much I love you. Have you guys ever had, had the, the blessing of looking at your spouse or looking at your children or looking at your grandchildren and this feeling of love just overwhelm you? You, you know, when you have that feeling, it's almost, for me, all I can do is get on my knees and praise the Lord and cry. You know, God has, has blessed me with so much. A wonderful man, two healthy kids, a beautiful granddaughter. But you know why I say that you'll never love me as much, you'll never know how much I love you to him? It's because when we feel that feeling, do we ever turn around and look at that feeling coming towards us? Do we ever look back and think about our parents? Now, both of my parents are gone, so I can't talk to them about this. But do we ever stop and think that our parents probably felt that exact same way about us? Do we ever even look at our spouse and say, could he or she love us that way? The problem with not doing that, though, is we're denying, in a sense, that love. We're not acknowledging it. We're not wrapping that love around us. And by, not, by denying the fact that that kind of love is coming towards us, we're denying the fact that God can love us that much. That feeling that we have towards our children and our grandchildren and our spouse is a fraction, a fraction of the love that God has towards us. Now, as I told you, we are working this summer with the kids on trusting God. And we did that great little story with Paul and the shipwreck and, and trusting God. And afterwards, we get to talk about it. Got to get to talk with them about the things that they're going through in their life and how they need to trust God and how sometimes they can feel like the ship that they're standing on is falling to pieces, but they can trust an awesome God. And for some reason, it came in my mind to say this to them. Nothing that you have ever done or will ever do can separate you from God's love. Now, the first time I said it, it's kind of like you guys. It's like, okay, yeah. And then I said again, Hear me, nothing you have ever done or will ever do or could ever do will separate you from the love of God. And all of a sudden they start paying a little bit more attention like, she's saying something. And then I said it again, you're young. You don't know what's going to happen to you, but hear me, nothing that you ever do or ever experience or will ever be can separate you from the love of God. And all of a sudden, their little faces change like, wow, she really means it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can we believe it? Can we believe it? Can it be real? Can you hear it today? Do you need to hear it today? Is there someone that you know that you need to hear, needs to hear it today? I'm human just like you, and there have been times in my life when I needed a lifeline, when things were going pretty bad and you feel very alone and you feel like you're not loved. And it was at one of those times in my life that I opened up the book of Romans and I came to this verse and it struck me just, as way, just the same way as it finally did with those kids. You mean, God, you really do love me? Even in this place, even when I felt like I was in the pit without a ladder to get out of it, you still love me, Lord? Can we believe that word? And if we can believe that word, can it make a difference? Can we rest in that assurance? This chapter that we read in Romans, I have a tendency to focus on the end of it because I happen to make that kind of one of my life verses. It helped me out of that pit, knowing that there's a God who loves me to that extent. But a lot of people 
go to the beginning of it, and they find their assurance in those words which are commonly read, we know that all things work together for good for all those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. It's a great statement, isn't it? Isn't it something that we've probably all said at one point or another when the world is falling apart? Well, somehow God's going to bring this together. Do I have any English teachers here? Okay. Because when you break down this sentence, and I won't get into the details of the Greek translation and all that, but when you break it down, it kind of like, what, what's the subject of this sentence? Is it all things? Is it God? Is it the Holy Spirit? Well, when you break it down, when you break it down, there's a better translation from the reading of that passage when you look at the, at the difficulties of the Greek. And these are theologians who did this. This isn't me. These are people way smarter than me. The passage is better read. God works all things towards ultimate good with and through those who love him. With and through those who love him. So God is the subject, and he's doing these good things not in spite of us, not outside of us, not in spite of us, but with us and through us. And why is that a better reading? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And one of them is the fact that there's an ultimate good plan. There is an ultimate plan that our Creator has for us, for this world. You know, a builder, if any of you have worked in construction, you don't start building something with some kind of blueprint, some kind of plan, some kind of idea, some kind of drawing. Jack, to me, is a, a mastermind because when he does something, I give him a task I want something done like the cross that will be here. You know, nothing happens for a little while because those little wheels are turning. And then all of a sudden I start seeing slips of paper all over the house where things are drawn out and dimensions and things like that. And then all of a sudden the wood's brought in and it's created. A builder builds with a blueprint or with a plan. And we can believe our creator has a blueprint just simply by looking at humanity, looking at the human body. You think about the intricacies of how the human body is made, how our DNA works, how our healing system works, all of those things, all of these things that work together. And he said it to the prophet Isaiah again in chapter 46, verse 10. God said this, For I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all of my good pleasure. God's got a plan, and nothing is going to stop that plan, which is why there's a great reading, again, of this assurance, because no matter what humanity does, no matter what our sins are, we cannot stop God's plan. Now, the Old Testament is full of all kinds of wonderful stories. One of the most famous and, and drawn out in detail is the story of Joseph, the youngest son of Jacob, the son who was favored, the son who was given a coat of many colors, the son who was pampered, the son who saw visions of his eventual rule and tormented his brothers to the point where they were jealous. Those brothers took him, were first going to kill him, but then decided just to sell him to gypsies who took him to Egypt where he ended up in prison. And you would think that this proposed leader that God had promised words over him when he was young in visions, he ends up in prison. Certainly God's plan was thwarted, but it wasn't. We know that Joseph goes on to become the leader right next to the Pharaoh that saves not only Egypt, but also the Jewish nation from famine. God has a plan. The greatest example of that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Satan thought that his plan had been thwarted when they put Jesus on the cross. But we know, we know that there was a greater plan. That greater plan includes exactly what Jesus did for us on that cross. Eternal salvation. Genesis 1, God made this creation and humanity to be the leaders, the image bearers of God on this creation. And nothing has taken that job away from us. It was God's desire 
to have humanity in a Garden of Eden in perfect harmony, creation and humanity, where God could come down and walk through his creation and say, what's going on? What's do, what are you doing? Let's do it this way. It was God's desire to be in relationship with humanity and with creation. But our sin threw us out, but God's plan will not be changed. God's eternal plan will not change, and God's eternal plan will be done through us. That verse that we read in, Mom, in Romans says that we were called. We are called not to just sit back and cry and lament, although there's plenty of times in our life when it is proper to sit and lament and to cry at the feet of God, but that is not where we stay. We are called. We are called for a purpose, and we are called for a purpose to partner with God. Can we trust God? Can we believe God? Can we know that God loves us enough? Have you ever looked at DNA? We know that DNA is what makes us unique, right? And if you look at some of the scientific things, you see those little swirls. This is a cross-section of DNA. And so is this. And so is this. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Out of the millions of ways that God could have put you together, he put you together the way you are, where you are, and how you are. Paul said we were foreknown. God put this DNA together in you to create in you, in his foreknowledge, the person that he needed you to be here in this time and in this place. You were foreknown. And in that foreknowledge, you were predestined. You were predestined to be here with this specific set of DNA unique to you. You know, I always wondered, how do scientists know that snowflakes are unique, each one of them? But even more incredible, DNA is beautifully created, uniquely done, each and every one of you. God created it with his foreknowledge and predestined you to be here in this place, in this time, with these abilities. Because he was going to call you. He was going to call you to step out into faith and trust and love, to work in and through his creation, to work in and with God, in God, not God in us, us in God, in love, to create salvation in this world. And those who he called, he justified. Now I'm going to add a little step in there, because I believe God foreknows every human being that is created. And I believe God has predestined every human being that is created to be a special part of his plan. And I believe he calls every single human being into that plan. But we have a responsibility. That is our Wesleyan heritage to understand that we have a responsibility to answer that call. We can just sit down and just say, you handle it. But God calls us and we are to respond. And when we respond, we become justified, made right with God. Does that mean we're perfect? Far from it. But it means that we are stepping into God. We are in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ's righteousness has justified us so that we can stand in righteousness. And who he has made righteous and justified, he has glorified. Can we believe that? Can we trust that? Can we believe the creator of such immense, unique beauty? Can we trust him enough? Can we trust in his love? Can we believe it and stand up and answer the call and be made righteous in Christ and receive here and now the glory of walking with our Savior?
what then are we to say about these things? <laughs>